Alright guys, welcome back to another video on Emma Hinge. Yet again, I'm once joined by Oscar Silva and we're going to be, today we're going to be breaking down UFC 257, the first pay-per-view of the year and what a pay-per-view we've got in store with us uh, this weekend. An absolute incredible card, incredible main event, incredible co-main event and top to bottom a really good interest in fights. I'm joined by Oscar Silva all the way from uh, uh, California, Calif wait you just told me, was it California? Chicago. Chicago, oh. I get it mixed up every time. I literally just asked him before before we started uh, uh, shooting, uh, and he said uh, it was uh, Chicago. So yeah, I hope uh, everything over there, the weather is okay, and I uh, hope you're having a good time over in America. I absolutely am, and this weekend I'm heading over to a friend's house to watch the fights. It's going to be amazing. Oh, have a great time! Uh, unfortunately, we can't do that in the UK, so you know, make sure you can do uh, you know take full advantage of that and have a great time with you, mate. I will. I will. A Connor fight week is different than any other fight week there is. Well, yeah, exactly. When Connor's uh, involved in MMA, you know, it just interests everybody in the sport. You know, it, it makes a, a different. It feels like a different, you know, type of fight week. When Connor's fighting, everyone's watching around the world, and uh, everyone's tuned in, and he's going to break records uh, th this week, and I, I, I'm, I'm for sure. It won't, might not be the attendance record, but he's going to break records. 100%. Yeah, it always it always stimulates the industry when he's fighting. They always make like about a hundred million dollars in revenue Whew. when he fights. That's ridiculous, man. That kind of money is ridiculous. How much he brings in, how much everyone wants to see him fight, and a lot, a lot of people want to see him fight, but most of the people want to see him lose. That, that that that's what it is. A lot of people want to see him fail, but you know, Connor lives up to lives up to it every time. Yeah, and over here in the States, they actually raised the pay-per-view price by $10. Oh, no. So you can expect that they're going to get even more money than they got from the Cowboy fight. Oh, that's ridiculous. Well, how, how much is it over there in the in America? It's uh, $70, I believe. What? So uh, over here in the UK, we have to pay for BT Sport, uh, which is uh, 80 quid per month, and then we've got to pay for like the pay-per-view on top of that. Wow, that's, that's a lot. Uh, for ESPN, you can get it for a year for $50. Woo! I need to come over to America. But you've got to pay for all them pay-per-views. That's that's the problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, un unless you're one of Dana White's enemies, the streamers, you know. You've got <laughs> something prepared for them this year. Well, that's none of us. So we're, we're, we're good. We're good to go. We're not enemies. We're, we're allies, Dana White, if you're watching this. We're allies. We are. <laughs> First yeah. fight of the UFC 257 card. We kick it off with the Swedish Emir Albazi versus... Uh, oh. Uh, we just pronounced this before the video. Um, Zagalez Zagumulov. <laughs> uh, he's fighting at 125 pounds. A good, decent fight to kick it off the card. How do you see this one going, Oscar? I think this is a very close fight on paper. I think Zagumulov is a threat on the ground in every way possible. He's going to try to ground and pound you. He's going to try to submit you as well. But he usually gets a decision win. So... That's what I think he'll do here, but you cannot sleep on Albazi. Albazi is a killer. He has all kinds of submission victories. He has Kimura wins. He has triangle wins. He can catch you in a submission at any point during the fight. So I just think Zuma Gulov needs to stay out of those submissions, and he'll get his hand raised by unanimous decision. I agree 100%. In uh, Emir Albazi in his last fight, you know, he got that triangle choke versus Malcolm Gordon. Beautiful performance that night as well. Uh, before that, he got he earned his contract with a win, a key lock win over Ryan Curtis. Uh, and you can just see on his record how good he is on the ground. He fought in Bellator once upon a time as well. His lone loss comes to Jose uh, Torres when he got released. Uh, Jose Torres was once in the UFC, if I'm correct. Yeah, he got released from the UFC when they went on that mad flyweight cutting spree back in uh, back in 2019, 2018. Yeah, so Jose Torres is the only loss to Emir Albazi's career. And uh, but Zuma Gulov, he's got some good wins on his record. If you look through his record, he's got the, the likes of Tyson Nam. Uh, Tegi Alumbekov, who's now in the UFC, uh, he's got some really, really good wins under uh, under his belt. But in his UFC debut, he did lose to uh, uh, Ran Ranian uh, pa Paiva uh, in his UFC debut by unanimous decision. Uh, so uh, in in this fight, you know Emil Albazi training out London Street Fighters in England. You know he looked impressive in his last fight with Malcolm Gordon. If if uh, Emil Albazi wants it to hit the ground, he, I think he, that's where he's going to take over. We've seen how good he is uh, on the on the ground with his BJJ. 
and I think this is where the fight is going to go. I think uh, Amir Abaz is going to take the floor to the uh, the fight to the floor and get a submission win in this uh, in in this in this in this fight. Uh, what, what what are your thoughts? How, how, who wins and uh, how how they get it? I think Zuma Gulag can stay out of those submission attempts. He doesn't have too many losses. In fact, he's never been submitted. So I don't trust Albazi to do it here. I'm going to have to go to Zuma Gulov to control him on the ground and escape every submission attempt presented to him and to get his hand raised. Yeah, that's a brilliant point you made there. Never been submitted in 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 his in his career, uh, but he has been finished via punches. But I don't see that uh, with Almir Albazi uh, being a problem for uh, Zuma Gulov in this fight. But I, I feel like he's going to take it to the ground and end up trying to find a submission in 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 the fight. Uh, moving on to uh, the next fight of the evening, a good clash at 145, uh, 145 pounds, a really underrated fight. Uh, Nick Lentz versus Movsar Ivoloyev. Oh, I don't know whether I pronounced that right, but that was probably the best I'll ever do in my life. But 145 pounds, Nick Lentz was scheduled to take on uh, Mike Grundy, and then Mike Grundy's former opponent, Movsar Ivoloyev, steps in to take on Nick Lentz. This is a good stepping stone, I think, for Ivoloyev. I think he's going to go in there. Get a win in any way he wants, in my opinion. I think he's, he can take the fight any way he wants. Standing on the on the ground, he, he's an absolute beast. If you've seen him fighting against Mike Grundy, uh, the wrestling exchanges them two shared in that fight was incredible. You know, Mike Grundy's a really good wrestler in his own right, and that's really rare if you come from uh, England or Britain. You're you're not good at wrestling if you cut, if if you're over here. Uh, but you know, Mike Grundy's got some really decent wrestling, and uh, you know, Movsar Ivolayev, they had some really good wrestling chain. Exchanges exchanges in that fight but I feel like Movsar Ivolayev is going to take the fight wherever he wants and he's going to troll him for the whole 15 minutes what's your opinion yeah I think that this is a really good spot for Ivolayev he took this on short notice that's why it's a catch weight at 150 pounds mm -hmm. and Movsar Ivolayev is one of the few guys in the UFC that's undefeated with over 10 fights he's 13 and 0 and he's coming off that win over Mike Grundy and Nick Lance is just, he's just been, had an up and down career. He's beating good guys. He's lots of guys he shouldn't, he shouldn't lose to. And I just think that Mavsar is better everywhere. I just think Mavsar can, can just take him down and control him and establish octagon control, get some decent ground and pound. But I do think that Nick Lance is tough enough to uh, stay in the fight long enough to lose by decision. That's just how I feel. I think uh, Evil Lev is going to be a really tough challenge for anybody in that top 15. I, I absolutely agree with you. I think uh, uh, Evil Lev can take the fight wherever he wants and he, he'll control the fight wherever he takes it. If, whether it's on the ground in them wrestling exchanges or whether it's on the feet and outpointing him. I think that's the, the, how the fight's going to go the full 15 minutes and uh, Evil Lev is just going to grind him out or if not uh, get a, a point a point decision win off with his, with his fists. I think Evil Lev takes it and proves the 14-0 and, and uh, gets a good name under his belt. A veteran Nick, in Nick Lentz who's beat some really good guys and fought some really good guys. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at uh, Nick Lentz's uh, track record, who he's fought, we, we're looking just recently, we're talking about Gray Maynard, uh, Charles Oliveira, Arnold Allen in his last fight at the start of 2020. You know, he's fought some really, really good guys. Evan Dunham, uh, Durham, or uh, however you would, however you would say that one. Um, he's fought Wick, Will Brooks. He's fought some really, really good guys in his career in the, inside the UFC, but I think most are, if alive, he's younger. He's fresher. He's going to come into this fight. I think he's better all around, and he will take the flight to wherever he wants and control him for the full 15 minutes. Uh, a good one at 185 pounds. Andrew Sanchez, the tough. Oh, let me let me remember what tough it, it might have been. Tough 21, if I'm correct. I don't know. I, I really haven't kept much tabs on the tough seasons as of late, to be honest. Well, who we got? Uh, Andrew Sanchez versus uh, uh, Floyd Mayweather's uh, protege, the only one who's signed under, under Floyd Mayweather in MMA, Mahmoud Marumedov. <laughs> uh, who have you got in, the, in this one? Who do you think wins? I absolutely have Marudov in this one. I think that uh, Sanchez is just, you know, he won the Ultimate Fighter. He just never lived up to his potential. He's had a rocky road. He's been knocked out on several occasions. He got head kicked by Anthony Smith and put to sleep. He was actually uh, a big underdog in his last fight against uh, Terman. Oh, yeah. And he knocked him out early on. And that, that was a real surprise for a lot of people. And in this fight, I think, I think Muradov 
is just unstoppable. He's on. He's had more than ten wins in a row by now, and uh, most of them have been by knockout. And you look at Sanchez getting knocked out recently. That's where. That's why I got a side with Murdoch by knockout. And I say it probably happens in the third round because that's when Sanchez has been getting knocked out. He gets tired and he gets finished. And Muradov has a two-inch reach advantage, a one-and-a-half reach advantage on him, I mean. And um, I just think that he can avoid the takedowns and he can punish him and get the finish late. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Uh, I said you, you said there that Andrew Sanchez, you know, he's been knocked out before. Uh, he he's been knocked out by Anthony Smith and Ryan uh, James back at the Ultimate 26 final. Uh, you know, he got knocked out uh, then twice in a row. You said that he's very open. He got knocked out by Kevin Casey as well back in the day over in RFA in 2014. So you said that he's very vulnerable of getting knocked out in in in, in his as he's been knocked out before in his career. He he won. Ultimate, uh, the Ultimate Fighter 23, I was two seasons off, I was close, uh, back when Phil Hawes was in the Ultimate Fighter. Wow, that was, that was a while ago. Yeah, 2016, that's when uh, uh, Andrew Sanchez won that final against none other than Khalil Roundtree. Khalil Roundtree is coming right up in this card. Yes, yeah. So and his uh, he, then he fought Trevor uh, Trevor Smith. He won by United decision, and then he got knocked out by uh, Smith and Janes. Uh, then he returned with Perez and uh, Mark Andre Barut, and they lost against decision against uh, 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 Marvin Vittori, who you know he's top five in the middleweight. And then got that in, that incredible, you know, as you said there, huge underdog versus Wellington Terman. Gets that right cross, absolutely starches him. Yeah, a beautiful knockout. But uh, as you see, yeah, you know, uh, Andrew Sanchez, he's been knocked out before. Been, he, as you said there, he's probably very open to getting knocked out. Very chinny. And uh, I feel like uh, this is the story of the fight as well. I think uh, Mac, uh, Ma Mar Maradov is going to go in there and uh, finish uh, Andrew Sanchez by a spectacular fashion with an absolutely a, a really good knockout within maybe the first round or maybe the early second round. I think he's going to have too much power. His boxing is going to be too crisp and he's going to finish the fight. I have to agree with you there. And well, uh, speak of the devil, Khalil Drowntree versus Marcin Pracnio. Look at that, eh? Lenny's upgrading in his language. You know, he's doing so well. Uh, wh wh what's your thoughts on the 205 pound uh, lightweight, light heavyweight bout? Khalil Drowntree actually was set to retire, but he came out of retirement for this fight. This fight is very significant for his career. I do think that Khalil Drowntree possesses a lot of power, but He's lost to he's lost to guys that he shouldn't have lost to because he he's just unreliable to be honest. Uh, his skill set is not yet complete. You know he got taken down by uh, Elon Kutalaba and grounded pounded until he went to sleep. It was it was a very unfortunate loss for him. And after that, I never really felt comfortable picking him to win. But against a guy like Pragnio, who got destroyed by Mike Rodriguez in his last outing, it was a clinching. He got need in the clinch over and over again, and he had no answer for it. Kind of reminded me of Anderson Silva and Rich Franklin. Those two fights where he just dominated him in the clinch. Khalil Roundtree uh, doesn't necessarily do his best work from the clinch. He likes to get those big, uh, big uh, bombs, you know, those overhand rights, those hooks. And I think he'll put out Pregnio very early on with a big bomb. And that's just going to be the story of a uh, Rauncher's career, you know, getting those early knockouts, but if it if it goes too long, it, he's going to, you know, have a terrible performance. But I'll side with Rauncher here because Pragnio is just not just not up there for me, and he'll probably be leaving the UFC very soon. Yeah, you said that he's on a four-fight losing streak at the moment. Uh, current in his last fight, or free fight, I mean, he lost uh, he lost against uh, Mike Rodriguez, got finished, got finished by Mag uh, Magomedov and Kalaev. There's no shame on that one, but Sam Alvey, man, he got knocked out by Sam Alvey. Uh, you know, with the, how Sam Alvey's looking at the moment, that was Sam Alvey's last win, and it was back in 2018, and Sam Alvey currently is on a five-fight I think he's on a four or maybe five fight losing streak at the moment currently. Uh, no, he went to a draw against Unjung yeah, in his last actually, one. Yeah, whether that counts, yeah, but yeah, he went to a draw. Before that, he was on a four fight, four fight losing streak. 
But you know, he lost, you know, he's on a free fight loser streak at the moment, Mark Neil Pacquiao. Uh, but as you said there, I think Khalil Roundtree is going to use that clinch as well. When he got that loss against uh, Johnny Walker, he went away, he went to Bangkok, improved on his Muay Thai, came against Eric Anders. And that was one of the best performances I've ever seen from him. How he improved from that Johnny Walker fight to Eric Anders, that was probably one of the most astonishing things I've ever seen in, in my life. That How a fighter can turn around so quickly he looked incredible in that Eric Anders fight and then unfortunately he needs to improve in that takedown defense as we saw in the Iron Kutalaba fight gets taken down just ground and pounded until he's out and I, I feel like a Marky Pacquiao doesn't possess the the takedown uh, um the takedown um what word am I takedown um offense and, you know he's not going to look for that takedown I don't think a lot of his uh, wins on his record have been via punches via strikes so I don't think he's going to look to take Khalil Roundtree down and I think it's going to be a stand up a stand up uh, affair and uh, we're going to see Khalil Roundtree clip him maybe inside the clinch with the knees and the elbows that he said there in this last fight Mark New Pacquiao you know he didn't have any answers for Mark Rodriguez and he eventually got the uh, got finished and I think that's going to be the same uh, in this fight I think it's going to be the story of the fight I think uh, Khalil Roundtree is going to get in close, use his Muay Thai, use them elbows, and end up finishing the fight in round one. That's very possible, and that's what I am going with as well. Uh, nice, nice. I I'm glad to see that we're both on par uh, while we're picking. We both went for Milar Bar Well, you went for Zumagulov, actually. I went for Milar Barzi. I We both went for Movsar Ovalayev. We both went for um, um, Mar Maradov. Both went for Khalil Roundtree. And now, the fifth fight of the evening. Sarah McMahon versus Julia Pena. Who are you going for? This is a coin flip fight. I honestly can't tell you that I prefer to pick one over the other. I do know that Juliana Pena had that, such an unfortunate loss in the last fight. Jill, Jermaine Duranami is a Dutch kickboxer. And she was able to submit her in the third round out of nowhere. One of the most shocking things I've ever seen, to be honest. And she got that performance to the night bonus thanks to that. And Juliana Pena was this close to uh, possibly getting the decision that night. And I, I was so surprised by that because Pena, Pena's, you know, she's pretty re reliable in terms of uh, results in the octagon. One of her only recent losses besides that was to... Valentina Shevchenko, who beats anybody on any given night. And Valentina Shevchenko submitted her. I don't see McMahon to be as big as a mission threat as uh, Valentina is. So that's why I do think that Pena can probably get uh, the decision win here. And also in her fight with Jermaine, she actually had a long layoff. She had fought Nico Montano the year prior, and she got her hand raised there after uh, coming back from a uh, Coming a mother, and her striking looked a very, very you know decent, especially against someone as good of a kickboxer as Jermaine. Jermaine had Amanda Nunes rocked in that rematch. If nobody remembers that, she had her in trouble, and she was holding her own against Jermaine Duranami. In fact, she outstruck her in the second round, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm gonna have to side with Pena here. When the striking uh, can hang with Jermaine, it can certainly hang with someone like McMahon. On the ground, I don't know who has the edge, really. I would have to say McMahon, but let's not forget she's at the end of her career. She's been around a long time. She lost to Ronda during a title reign back in 2014, so I don't know how long she has left. McMahon is actually favored here. I, I don't know. This is a, a pick on fight for me. How about you? Uh, I, I'm going with Julia Pena. I think she can uh, get, win the fight in any in any way uh, that she wants. I think she's better on the ground. And you, you mentioned there that... Um, uh, in her last fight against JDR, she looked a phenomenal on the feet. You know, she looked very, very vastly improved, and she was holding her own. So I feel like Julia Pena, you know, can she take the fight wherever she wants? But you know, she unfortunately suffered that uh, guillotine choke. That you know, that maybe that hail mary from JDR. But you know, yeah, she got uh, choked out eventually, and she got put to sleep against uh, against Jerry Duran. Out of all odds. You know, incredible that was. But, you know, I feel like she's better on the floor. She has a lot of submissions. She's really good on the ground, uh, Benya. She's won the Ultimate Fighter before. And uh, she, her only losses in the UFC have came to Valentin Shevchenko and Jorane Duranami. There's no, no no shame on that. She's fought some really good high-level competition in her, in her career. Jessica I, Kat Zingano, in her, in her last win against uh, Nico Montano before she lost to Jorane Duranami. 
But I feel like she's going to get back to winning record, back to winning way, and uh, she's going to improve to back to the win column against uh, Sarah McMahon. I think she'll probably end up taking the fight wherever she wants. But I, I never, ever, ever would bet on a, a a KO or a TKO in a women's fight. I, you just don't see it happen nowadays. It's either a submission or a decision, and that's what I'm going for here in the Julia Penny's way. Especially with these two, they always tend to go to a decision. Yep, hundred percent. I can agree more. Well, uh, I think this is the. Is this the main card fight? Maybe it would be. Oh, are we on? Uh, no, this is not no, the main card. Oh, we're well, on Tavares. We're still. Yeah. We're still on the prelims. Brad Tavares. You know, he's uh, had a uh, a really bad run as of late. Uh, get recently getting um starched. Uh, he got starched in his last fight, uh, in his few fights ago. Was it Edmund Shabazian? He got starched, but he fought, yes, it was. did he fight someone recently? Since in get knocked no, out. No, he didn't. Oh, Edmund Shabazzian nope. was his last fight. Okay, this is interesting to see how, how he looks in his fight against Antonio Carlos Jr., who's also on a bad run as of late. I think in in his last fight, if I'm not mistaken, it might have been Uriah Hall, and it was in a split decision. And therefore, uh, before that, he lost to Ian Heinish, a guy that, if you look at his record, he's fought some really good guys, Tim Boach, Jack Marshman, Eric Spicely, but, you know, he's, he's finished all of them. But when it comes to the good guys, you know, the Ian Heinishes, that Uriah Hall's, you know, he's, uh, he's end up uh, getting... Um, submitted he's lost to Daniel Kelly back in the day Patrick Cummins yeah, but and you know if you look at um when he comes up to against like Eric Spicely Jack Marshman Tim Boach he finishes him but Brad Tavares on the other hand he's a he's a really good really good fighter his wrestling is really good but I, I feel like he's going to use it in this fight and against uh Antonio Carlos Jr uh, his last win was against Christoph Jotko back in 2018 when he starched him Absolutely incredible win that was. And uh, since then, he lost to Israel Adesanya. Unanimous decision back at the Oma, twi uh, the Oma fight at 27 for now. And then Edmund Shabazin with that left head kick. Absolutely, absolutely came from hell. Knocks him out at UFC 244. Masvidal versus Diaz. The baddest motherfucker. Oh, shouldn't probably should have swear. Baddest MF, MF, BMF uh, card. Uh, uh, and he you know, knocked him out. Absolutely out cold in that fight. But in, in this yeah, fight, gonna... uh, who, who are you picking? Uh, uh, well, I do think that Tavares, this is uh, a favorable matchup for him, especially after we've seen him getting knocked out multiple times against uh, Whitaker. That, that was a long time ago, but nonetheless, that was very early on. And against Edmund Shabazian, who I knew Edmund Shabazian was really good, but once he knocked out Brad Tavares, I knew he was the real deal. And especially since he did it so quickly, and he was just, it was, it was a flawless performance for Edmund that night. And Brad Tavares has gone 25 minutes with Israel Adesanya. And that's a really big statement, even even uh, for Adesanya at the time, who wasn't fully developed into the monster that he is these days. And I do think that Antonio Carlos Jr. can beat most of the guys uh, in the lower spots in the rankings right now because his jiu-jitsu is just next level. And he even beat Marvin Vittori by unanimous decision, something that that shouldn't be overlooked. And that lost to Ian Heinish, I just think that was a bad matchup for him. But in this case, Brad Tavares' wrestling should be more than enough to overwhelm Antonio Carlos Jr. And maybe he gets a stoppage, but Antonio Carlos Jr. has fought some pretty good strikers like Uriah Hall. I personally thought he beat Uriah Hall because he had his back for an entire round. And the ju and the judges didn't care about that. They they decided to give it Uriah Hall because it was better, his better uh, success in the striking. But I did think that Antonio Carlos Jr. belongs in the mix with these top middleweights, despite that loss. And I'm gonna have to side with Tavares here because you know, when it comes to really bigger fights, he tends to shine even if he loses. And Antonio Carlos Jr. lost to Ian Hine issue who I don't think is quite ready for the top yet. So I'm going to have to start with Tavares to win by unanimous decision. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, at Tavares in uh, in his in his career, he's only ever been submitted once, and that was uh, against Court McGee in in an exhibition bout, uh, which is uh, currently you know not really official, but you know he's been submitted before uh, by Court McGee, 
and the level in difference between BJJ and, and Colt McGee and Antonio Carlos Jr. is absolutely, you know, tremendous. You know, it, it, the guy's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. He's incredible. That's what he's known for, Antonio Carlos Jr. It's just whether he can get the fight to the floor. You know, uh, you know, we've heard, you know, he's got some decent wrestling, Brad Tavares, on his own right. But can Antonio Carlos Jr. get that fight to the floor? Yeah, I, that, he trains out of ATT. I think that's a. I think that's going to happen. I think uh, you know Antonio Carlos Jr. would take this fight to the floor and end up looking for a submission. And I feel like he's just going to stay on his back for the whole 15 minutes, just you know, kind of looking for that submission, but not getting it. I think he's just going to unsu be unsuccessful for a submission, but he's just going to take him down at will. Yeah, this is going to be similar to my prediction with the Sumagula Balbasi fight. I think that uh, the loser will just continuously go for submission but just being unsuccessful with his attempts mm -hmm. yep yep 100 percent. well moving on to a really good one at lightweight when this one got announced i was excited for this one uh, i'll let uh oscar introduce <laughs> who's fighting at 155 pounds at 155 pounds we're kicking things off with for to end the prelims we're going with arman tazarkian that's the best I can do, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> against a Nazrat Hasperet. That's the best I can do here. And we got uh, Arman, who's 15 and two, against Hasperet, who is 12 and three. I do, do believe that we're gonna see a really entertaining fight between these two. Both guys like to strike, but uh, Arman prefers to wrestle, as he showed in his fight with a uh, 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 Mercier, Albin Mercier. Mm -hmm where he got wrestled in for three entire rounds and showed that he was here to stay. And I believe we're going to see a really, really back-and-forth fight, but in the end, we're going to see Armand grapple him for 15 minutes and get his hand raised by a unanimous decision. I actually don't see too many finishes happening on this card, and this is going to be one of those fights where it will be entertaining, but it will go the distance. Yeah, that, that's a good way of putting it. You're not many finishes on this card. But, you know, it'll be a very entertaining card nonetheless. If you look at Armin, uh, Armin's uh, record, his only loss inside the UFC did come to none other than Islam Makishev, which is, you know, that, that that's that's a win that you should probably take in your stride at the moment. A guy who's really a, a legitimate lightweight and they're going to make some waves in that division. Other than that, he's, he beat uh, Olivier Abu, uh, Abin Messier, you can have decision at UFC 240. And then he beat Davi Ramos, you know, a really good a good, a good ground fire, uh, a good BJJ. That was a, that was a good fight for him, you know, decision, you know, decision win again. But, you know, then he comes out against Nazrat Hakupras, who's been knocked out before in his career against Drew Dober in an absolutely insane fight. You know, he got knocked out then, and but, you know, he returns with a great win against Alex Munoz and a unanimous decision as well. But in this fight, I think Armin's going to have enough to take this fight. I think he's going to use his wrestling in this fight and just grind out another win. I think he's going to grind out that unanimous decision win. He trains out of Tiger Muay Thai. I feel like he's fallen in love with his, uh, his hands a bit. You know, he's going to probably want to strike. He's probably going to want to, you know, put his hands on Nazrat. But I feel like he'll end up putting putting Nazrat uh, to the cage and maybe end up looking for a takedown. And that's what he's going to do. I think he's going to get that takedown, grind the fight 15 minutes and get that win. He's 24 years of old. 24 years old. He's going he's gonna to be learning every minute. He's a very young fighter in the 155 pounds. And I feel like he's going to get a win against Nazrat Hakrapas. Yeah, I got to agree with you. Uh, and that's right, did get knocked out in his last outing. So, uh, you know, he's not been looking the best as of late. And uh, Armand should out-wrestle him and get that win. Mm -hmm. An exciting one in the women's uh, 125-pound division. I said that one slowly. 115. 115 strawweight uh, division. Uh, Mariana Rodriguez versus the ever-exciting, entertaining Amanda Hibas. Uh, in her last fight, she... she um. Uh, who did she beat in her last fight? I should know. It, 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 I feel like it was Paige Runs Out, but I feel like she fought after that as well. I'm not too sure. 
It was uh, last no, fight. It, it was, was. Paige Van Zandt. Yeah, uh, UFC 251. At Usman versus Miles Vidal. Yeah, she uh, she submitted Paige Van Zandt. You know, sent her to BKFC and uh, Mariana Rodriguez. You know, she's got a really good record. If you look at her, her record as well, she's fought some really really good high level guys. In her last fight, she lost a split decision versus Carla Esparza, who's making a late run to the to the title. But she's drew against Cynthia Carvillo. She beat Tisha Torres. Best beat Jessica Aguilar. She drew to Randa Marcos back in the day. Yeah, I feel like. Uh, uh, you know, she's a really good fighter, and this is a really good test for Amanda Rebas. But I think she passes it in flying colours. I think she goes in there, you know, gets her hands on her, takes her to the ground, and gets that submission win against uh, Mariana Rodriguez. What do you think? Yeah, I do think that this will be uh, not too competitive because Amanda Rebas can out wrestle her for sure. For sure. In those fights that uh, Amanda, uh, that Amanda Rebas. One, she's always been really good in the striking department, except, of course, the one where she got knocked out. But we've seen her striking improve significantly, um, especially against someone like Mackenzie Dern, who we've seen her striking, you know, her striking back then was just uh, horrendous, to be honest. And Amanda Hiba showed just how good she was in comparison to a low-level striker like uh, Dern at the time, so... I do think that Rodriguez is going to be more active on the feet, but it won't matter because she's going to get taken down. If you saw the fight with Carla Esparza, Esparza took her down when she wanted to, and she was not able to get too much grounded pound on her, but she was able to get control time, which uh, that, that's why the judges gave it to Carla. I do think that um, Amanda Hiba should try to go for a submission because uh, – Rodriguez is Brazilian, but it, this is completely... Th these two are on completely different planets in terms of jiu-jitsu, if, if you ask me. Uh, Amanda Hibas, uh, you know, she says she she slept on uh, on her gi or something, and her her uh, her gi was her pillow, something like that, uh, along those words. Ever since she was a little girl, she always was grappling. She's a black belt in judo and jiu-jitsu, so I do think she'll be able to get this to the ground for sure, and control her. The only concern here is that we have someone like um, Rodriguez who is taller. She is um, she is not as long as her, but the size here might play a factor here. And she she actually strikes five strikes per minute, significant strikes, and she's 50% accurate. So it's going to be pretty competitive on the feet, but on the ground it will be. But I do think uh, Rodriguez is is tough enough to escape any submission attempts and lose by a decision. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I feel like uh, I agree with you to a certain extent. I think Amanda Rebess will look for that, uh, that, that submission, but she won't get it, but she will... Uh... Grind out that win. A lot of uh, grinding wins in this in in this card. I feel like there's a lot of wrestlers, a lot of BJJ fighters. But when it gets to the top of the top of the card, that's where we start to see some uh, some knockouts. Yeah, and we're about to go on to one. Otman Azatar. When we talk about knockouts, we're talking about this guy. In his last fight against Karma Worthy, a, an underdog, you know, killer. You know, he beat Luis Pena, beat um, Devonte Smith. A good friend of his as well. Uh, you know, he beat Karma Werther in his last fight. Knocked out Team A Pakalim with an absolutely insane overhand right at UFC 242 in Abu Dhabi with uh, Khabib versus Poirier. And, you know, this guy's incredible, man. The way he, how the power he possesses in his hands is ridiculous. This guy is incredible. And I feel like, uh, I feel like Matt Ferrillo is a really good challenge for him. I think this guy's got a really good skills. Uh, I've seen him on Embedded. He looks in serious shape as well. In his last fight, he, he beat Luis Pena by split decision. And he beat Jalen Turner, unanimous decision. But, you know, he's, he's drew against Lando Venato. He's fought some really good guys in his career. If you look at that, uh, look at his, um, his recent record. But the one that stands out the most to me is Paulo Reyes. He got knocked out in that fight. And that was only back in 2018. In a minute as well. That was just in a minute. You know, does that, does that, that that's question signs. You know, does he start slow? You know, is he open to getting knocked out early on? And I think, and you know, that him getting knocked out in a minute versus Paulo Reyes, that, that doesn't look good. And I think Otman Azatar, you know, the power he possesses in his hands, you know, he's going to go in there, catch him with a punch. And I think that's going to be the end of the fight. I, I predict an Otman Azatar early finish once again. 
Yeah, Armin Zaytar, uh, he likes to get things done very quickly. I don't think many fights of his have even gone past the first round. He's going to be very dangerous, especially in that first minute. And as you pointed out, Frivola has been knocked out in the first minute by Marco Polo Reyes. Marco Polo Reyes, we've we've learned to not be UFC caliber. He's, he's uh, suffered many losses since then. And I, I feel like for Vola's only chance here is to get this to the ground and to maybe look for a submission. He has three submission wins in his career. Most of them were early on against not the best of competition, so I would not be confident in picking that. So I'm going to have to agree with you. The 13-0 and record on Upman and Zaytar looks great. This guy's going to be a very dangerous opponent for anybody. We still have to see how his ground game is, but I think he could, he could really crack up there with... Uh, Crack into the top 15 with a win like this, possibly. This is a big win. This is going to be a big win for him. I think uh, we, we should see him against the winner of uh, Diego and uh, and uh, Benil Darius because I just believe that he's up there. I, I agree with especially you. Especially if Diego wins because, uh, yeah, especially with, uh, if Diego wins because Benil is uh, a elite Abdelaziz client and so is Otman. You know, uh, I do think that Otman is up there with the best and he can also switch stance with you at any time which that that could be that could be very bad news for Matt for law um, this night what do you think I absolutely agree with you I think it's going to be a bad night for Matt for but you know I'm not counting him out but I think uh, um, uh, Ozata is just like his hands are very really really too I think it's going to be too powerful for Matt for in this night and I think he's going to get an early finish yeah that's what I said, I do think that uh, Frivola uh, might not be as good as Zaytar on the feet. And it really doesn't matter who's more technical, who's more strategic here. Because uh, I'm in a Zaytar just has that power that will erase any mistake he makes. And that's what's going to happen. He's going he's gonna to just be flawless that night with just one big bomb that's going to land and put him out. Yep, 100%. I agree with you. In the next fight, should we talk about uh, Jessica I versus Joanna Collarwood? You know, uh, Joanna Collarwood, the Scot, uh, traveling over to Dubai, but she doesn't train in Scotland. She, luckily to her, she trains in uh, in America. Uh, I'm not too sure in the gym that she trains at. It might be Syndicate MMA. There we go. Syndicate MMA trains over in America with her boyfriend, who is uh, maybe owns the gym. I'm not too sure. I, I remember that uh, circling uh, in the air. I can't remember. But anyway. Uh, in this fight, uh, Jessica I versus uh, Joanna Collarwood, who do you have, Oscar? Uh, uh, I have to go with Joanna Collarwood. Her performance last time was was terrible. She got outstruck by Jennifer Mai, and she got taken down and submitted. It was just a, it was a bad night for her. And uh, honestly, I believe she regrets taking that fight because she was set up to fight Valentin Shevchenko uh, before the pandemic, of course. And... That just didn't come to fruition, and it might never come to fruition. But against Jessica I, Jessica I is not, she's just not the best. She was even once on a five-fight losing skid, and it, I just, I cannot comfortably bet on her. She does have a win over Caitlin Chukagian, which I, I, you got to give her props for that, but that might just be how it worked out stylistically. I just don't see her at the top of the division anymore. Her loss to uh, a strawweight Cynthia Calvillo, just uh, she got dominated that fight. It wasn't too competitive, and uh, Calderwood can take it to the ground as well if necessary. And she even has a couple of submission wins there. But I do think that this is a like a classic flyweight women's fight. We're going to see a decision here. It's not going to be too entertaining to be honest. And I think Calderwood probably beats her. By unanimous decision, she actually has twice. She lands twice as many strikes per minute. Uh, she lands six strikes per minute, so that output will really benefit her in the judges' eyes. And this is just going to be a great performance by Calderwood. If she doesn't show up, though, I do think that Jessica I could win by split decision. So I, I think this is going to be a close fight, but Calderwood should outstrike her for sure. What do you think? 
exactly how I'm picking it. I think uh, Joanna Collingwood has got the you know the striking advantage in this fight with Jessica Jessica I, and uh, I think she just outpoints her in this fight. I think she sticks at range and uh, uses her you know her striking advantage and just kind of edges out a unanimous decision win against her Jessica. I. As you said there, once upon a time, Jessica I was on a five fight losing streak. Then stepped up to 125 pounds, and uh, you know she lost against Cynthia Calvillo in her last fight. Uh, if I'm if I'm correct, it was Cynthia where yeah when she stepped up to 125 pounds as well, and uh, he grinded out a win. But I she's highly ranked in the division that which is incredible. But I think uh, Coldwood gets the gets the job done in this fight after her last fight against Jennifer Meyer. She where she got submitted in round one by uh, Jennifer Meyer, but which is uh, Jennifer Meyer when she fought Valentina Shevchenko. We've seen the qualities uh, of Jennifer Meyer. You know, she handed uh, Shevchenko some problems in that fight and maybe, you know, uh, mapped out a win, um, a possibly how to beat Shevchenko. You know, uh, she, she, you know, she uh, got on top of her and kind of controlled Shevchenko in that fight. So uh, Jennifer Meyer props to her of, uh, you know, doing so great against one of the greatest uh, women fighters out that we have to date in Valentina Shevchenko. She done really well in that fight. But, you know, I feel like uh, Jessica I and versus Joanna Coldwood, I think Joanna Coldwood takes this fight. I feel like this is going to be a boring one and not an exciting one. But uh, Coldwood takes this win. In, uh, she, st she stays on the feet and now points her. Yeah, I gotta agree with you. I also gotta mention that Jessica I uh was uh I saw a post on Instagram of her saying that she was in a very bad shape physically, that uh that she had just been dealing with a lot of issues, uh even mentally as well. I, I don't believe she should be You got a question in the top of the division by yeah, now. Yeah, you got a question the mentality and the the physical, yeah. the mental health and the strength that she has right now. And I hope everything is alright with uh, uh, Jessica I, but uh, unfortunately I'm not picking her that night. I think she's uh, got a tough test in front of uh, a, a Scottish uh, a Scottish warrior in Joanna Calderwood. If she's going to bring in the heat and get that win. I agree with you there. Now maybe we're moving on to the probably the one of the maybe arguably the most anticipated fight on the card, is it is it Connor versus Dustin, or is it Dan Hooker versus Michael Chandler? In your opinion, who, what was the most anticipated fight? This is not. A, come on, dude. It's Connor, when Connor fights, the world watches. He brings in the biggest numbers. He sells the most pay per views. He he sells. He puts the most butts in seats. The guy's the real deal. But hey, this fight right here for the hardcore audience, especially people who know. What Michael Chandler is made of, if you've seen his fights with Eddie Alvarez, this is a really awesome fight, and Dan Hooker always brings it. What do you think about this fight? See, uh, I'm more excited uh, to see Michael Chandler fight, but I'm more excited to see the Dustin Poirier versus Conor McGregor fight. Is that, is that, does that make sense? No, it doesn't. So no, I'm more just, just say you're excited for both. I'm, yeah, I'm more excited to see Michael Chandler fight, but I'm excited for the Poirier versus Conor fight. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, we're, we're, I would we're. have to say that Conor and Poirier just—it's a great fight. Know, it's a really it has intriguing real fight. magic around it right now. Hundred mm, uh, percent. But anyway, we're talking about this fight. And um, Dan Hooker versus Michael Chandler. This is a really, this is a weird one to to kind of talk on. Michael Chandler, who's been out of the UFC, uh, fighting in a, a different promotion in Bellator. You know, he was a he's a champion over there. He fought um, in Strike Force once upon a time back in his uh, when he started his career. That's where he started. Fought in um, Bellator, had them wars with Eddie Alvarez, submitted every Al Eddie Alvarez back in 2011, then lost to Eddie Alvarez in 2013 in a split decision, and then he lost against Will Brooks twice uh, when Will Brooks was destroying Bellator uh, 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 back in back in the day in 2014. But you know, since then he's been on a been on a great run. He lost against uh, Brent Primus when he uh, had an ankle injury. Uh, eventually got that belt back. Then he got knocked out versus Patricio Pitbull. 145 odds, stepping up to 155 pounds. He got knocked out by Patricio Pitbull. Is that questions on his chin, maybe? You know, is can he take the shots? Uh, we don't know. We'll find out. And he stepped up against Sydney Outlaw, knocked him out. Stepped up against Benson and Henderson, an old Benson Henderson, and knocked him out. But, you know, there's questions on uh, Michael Chandler's chin. Can he take the punches? 
I don't know. I'm not too sure. Does Patricio Pitbull have really, just really good power? I, I, I think he just has really good power. Uh, another fighter that I would love to see in the UFC, Patricio Pitbull, it would be insane. But anyway... Michael Chandler versus Dan Hooker. I, I think Dan Hooker takes this, uh, takes the win. I think he uses his kickboxing to his advantage. His long reach, his length. You know, it, arguably uh, in his last fight against Dustin Poirier, you know, the, uh, he could have got that nod. But you know, it went to Dustin Poirier. You know, that was an incredible fight, a back and forth, a war. And he's had two wars in his last fight. Uh, he thought he had a war against Paul, Paul Felder, had a war against um, Dustin Poirier, and I feel like this one's going to be a good one for him. I think I feel like he's. He's gonna go in there earn a quick night. I feel like it, it maybe gets the knockout, but I feel like he's gonna use that kickboxing advantage. I think he's gonna be great on the feet. He's gonna use that reach. He's gonna have a long reach advantage. I, I believe anyway. It, 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 off the top of my head, I believe you have a good reach advantage. I'm not too sure on the actual uh, the reaches if if you're fond of them. Um, Four inches. Yeah, that's 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 uh, uh, that's a huge advantage for Dan uh, Dan Hooker. Four inch reach advantage. Incredible, and he's six foot. Uh, Michael Chandler's five foot eight, small guy. Uh, I, I got a favor Dan Hooker in this one, in my opinion. I think Dan Hooker is going to use his kickboxing advantage, his reach, yeah, how lengthy he is, and he gets the win. But if he gets clipped by Michael Chandler, it could be it could be end of the fight. But I don't think he will. I think he'll stay out of range. Well, I have got to agree with you, but I don't think that Hooker will get a finish here. I don't think it would be as aggressive, to be honest, because if you saw us, he went in there expecting a war, and that's what he got. He swung for the fences. He got hit a lot. He got hit uh, over 200 times in his last fight, in his last two fights. He's taken a lot of damage, but he's a little younger than uh, Michael Chandler. Chandler has had a long career. He's had 26 career fights. Uh, not as many as Hooker, but over time, he's he's been around the game longer. He was a champion in Bellator. He has the most title fight wins in Bellator history, if I'm not mistaken, at five. The way he just comes in there and looks for an overhand or tries to wrestle you, I, I think that will present problems for Hooker. But as we've seen, those guys at City Kickboxing, they like to keep it on the feet. They have excellent takedown defense. And his coaches gave uh, Dan Hooker a lot of criticism. For his last fight against uh, Dustin Poirier, where his defense was horrendous, but it did make for an, a very entertaining fight. He went in there looking for that bonus. They had the best round of uh, 2020, as we uh, announced a couple of weeks ago. But that sec that second round uh, of that fight was unbelievable. Those guys landed over a hundred significant strikes just in that round. I cannot believe what I was seeing that night. Dan Hooker, I do believe he beat Poria that night. When I was watching it live, I thought that um, Dan Hooker getting that takedown in the third round was enough to win to win him the fight, to be honest. I didn't think he, he put Felder, though. And those those fights are entirely different fights. And Michael Chandler was a Division One wrestler in the United States. Um, he actually wrestled Gregor Gillespie. He lost to him. But he's been in the mix with some of the greatest wrestlers in the nation. But Dan, Dan Hooker has really good takedown defense, and in this case, he could catch it with a knee. He could land a big bomb. You were asking about Chandler's chin. I saw that fight with Pitbull. When he got dropped, I do believe that that was a fairly early stoppage. He was clearly moving. He was defending himself. I did not agree with the referee stoppage in that case. There was also and I do believe that in the rematch, well. Michael Chandler. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, absolutely. Back of the head. Yeah. Michael Chandler would, I do believe he would win that rematch, if you ask me. But uh, I don't think we'll ever see it. But Dan Hooker will get his hand raised by unanimous decision, especially because his coaches are really mad that, that he was just trying to go for the knockout or the bonus in his last fight against Dustin. They, they were very critical of him. So in this case, I think he'll be a little more conservative. He'll fight smart. And that will ultimately lead him to being a more successful fighter because I think if he fought Pori smart on any given night, he could beat him. He could definitely convince the judges. And this is just a bad matchup for Michael Chandler, if you ask me, because Dan Hooker is much, much, much bigger than him. And he's never fought anybody like Dan Hooker. Dan Hooker is dangerous. 
uh, on the feet, just too dangerous for him, if you ask me. And he'll probably get the split decision. But I will say that Chandler's cardio is slightly better. And I do think he can win that third round. I do think this will be a 29-28 type situation. But I'll go with Hooker here. He could even score a knockdown. Uh, what do you think? That's exactly the way I'm putting it. I think uh, Dan Hooker is going to use his kickboxing, stick to range, use that front kick. I think that front kick to the body will be an important uh, move, uh, important kick for him in this fight. Using that, uh, but that could also lead for him to getting taken down. But I feel like he's, uh, he's going to use that front kick to the body very well in this fight and just stick to his range and just you know not let him get past his jab. I think that's how it's going to go. Yeah, that is uh, probably what's going to happen. To be honest. Well, I'm looking forward to the excitement and uh, what's going to go down. I'm really excited for his, de his debut and see what he kind of possesses inside the UFC. Uh, we got uh, in the main event, 155 pounds, as you said there, probably the and the most anticipated fight for you. Uh, Dustin Poirier versus uh, Conor McGregor, the return of the Mac. Ladies and gentlemen, UFC 257, Dustin Poirier versus Conor McGregor, a rematch, six years on, they run it down, they run it again, and they're fighting an Abu Dhabi Yas Island at Etihad Arena, but the most important thing is that who's going to win, and uh, Oscar's going to tell you who's going to win. When this fight was originally announced, I told you that I was not too excited for it, now watching the embedded, watching the countdown. I couldn't be more excited. I feel this this like a uh, feeling in my stomach, just butterflies. I'm so excited for this card. It's a, this kid-like energy, just going to sleep on Christmas Eve, just not being able to sleep because <laughs> you're so excited. Yeah, that's that's me right now. I'm very excited for this. This is going to be a spectacle to watch. Fans are here for our Conor fight. I thought it would feel very strange if there were no fans for a Conor fight, and there will be fans, about 2,000 as it were, uh, this past Saturday. And this is going to be really fun to watch. This is uh, this is not on those weird time schedules that, uh, well, for you at least, um, for me, it's going to be over here at 9 p.m. The fight tomorrow for me will be at 8, 8 a.m. So this is a, at the normal pay-per-view schedule here in the States. And this is going to be really fun. Connor will knock out Dustin. Plain and simple. That's just how it's going to go down. If you watch Connor's performance against Adi Alvarez, that was a masterclass, and I expect it to look similar. I do. If you saw those fights with uh, Poirier and Eddie Alvarez, both of them were very competitive. Uh, I, obviously, Poirier got the best of them in both bouts, but I do think that Dustin is very hittable. If you've seen his last two fights... You could go back uh, to uh, last... Uh, uh, if you're looking at Dan Hooker, look at Habib, uh, Max Holloway, Eddie Alvarez, Justin Gaethje. In all them fights, Dustin Poirier took a lot of shots. Carry on. Wars. Yeah. Yeah. He's taken so many shots. He's he w Even in his last fight, we were talking about that Hooker fight. He wasn't fighting too smart either. He has his hands down that second round. Even uh, Michael Bisping, at, uh, at, he was at the desk. He was yelling, hey, put your hands up, Dustin. Stop being, uh, stop being so foolish with your fighting style. And it, it was almost, he was also almost, almost looking like Justin Gaethje in there, just fighting so reckless. Of course, he, he went on to finish strong. Dustin Poirier has some of the best cardio in UFC history. In this fight with Max Holloway, I do think that fight was overlooked at how insane it was because we had just seen Kelvin Gaston out of Tanya go to war. And one of the greatest fights in UFC history. I do believe that fight was overlooked. Take a look at it. That will that will just blow your mind again. And let me remind you that Poirier was rocked by Max Holloway in that fight. Max Holloway, we just saw the guy set the record for most strikes in a single fight landed. And that shows that he doesn't have a lot of power. And if someone like Max Holloway can hit you like that, Imagine what Connor's legendary left hand can do. Just imagine. He was hurt bad by Dan Hooker as well. I think Connor has more power than anybody else in the division. And let's, he's only one and one in the division. He lost to Habib and he beat Eddie. And in this fight, we're going to see Connor in the division. He truly belongs in at 155. And he's going to have a legendary performance. Something so spectacular, it'll bring Habib out of retirement. What do you think? 
I, that, that's exactly the way I, I, I see the fight go. Uh, but um, I feel like the, the, this fight enters the second round. It, do you reckon uh, inside 60 seconds? I think Con Connor is underestimating Poirier's chin. He fought him at 145 pounds where he was cutting an unbelievable amount of weight. I, I do believe he said he was 190 pounds Ooh. when he got in the cage that night. Something insane. And uh, cutting that much weight caused Dustin to go to 155 after that fight. Mm -hmm. It was his last fight at 145 pounds. So that's why I do believe that this will go a little bit longer. That fight, I do believe, went about 110 seconds, their first fight. That was a wonderful performance by Connor. He, he cut him off on both sides and landed that left. He landed the spinning back kick, everything. Connor was just on his A game that night, and that really set him aside amongst the prospects that night and made him a huge star. He, he also released uh, the the nice old nickname, Mystic Mech. I predict these things, you know. And I I like to call myself a cult Oscar because, you know, 72% of the time I get my picks right. That's just how it goes. I usually get my picks right. And a cult Oscar predicts second round knockout, Conor McGregor. Mystic Oster How about you? predicts a second round knockout <laughs> for McGregor. I absolutely do. <laughs> uh, right now here in the States... Here in the States, uh, DraftKings, it's the, the UFC's betting partner. Mm -hmm. They have this promotion going on. If you bet $1, you'll get $257 if Connor wins by first-round knockout. I think they know they know a lot about the game over at DraftKings. They, they they know that people are expecting Connor to just run through Dustin. I think it'll be a little bit of a challenge. It'll look like the Eddie Alvarez fight where he hurts him constantly where he's just has his hands behind his back, landing those front kicks, attacking the his uh his uh, cardio, and I just think that Dustin's cardio won't matter. Of course, if this goes the distance, you're gonna I'm gonna have to lean Dustin. But assuming Dustin wants that war that he's been teasing at, he can't get in a war with Connor if you ask me. He won't be able to take those shots. He'll go down like a sack of potatoes in the second round. You're here here first. Well, that's it. Oscar predicts a second round knockout from uh, Mystic Mac uh, from McGregor. Uh, but uh, that's the exact. I, I see. I see. I see. It's going the second round, and I see McGregor landing that big left hand. And we see, as we talked about Dustin Poirier and his last, you know, a lot of fights. Dan Hooker, Habib, Holloway, Eddie Alvarez, Justin Gaethje. He's got hit. And he's got hit bad in all of the fights. And he, he you know, he's very hittable. He's, he's been rocked against Hooker, been rocked against Holloway, he was rocked against uh, Alves, rocked against Justin Gaethje. You know, oh, it's ridiculous how many times this guy's been in a war. And I feel like this is going to be the story of the fight. I feel like uh, Dustin Poirier wants that war. He's going to apply the pressure in the first round. And then he's going to try and get that war. Maybe McGregor's going to slip count a few times in the first round maybe stumble him a little bit but the second round is that that's where i predict it that's where i feel like he'll get them get him out of there and then they then he'll move on and then call out habib and then that rematch will happen in 2021 in dubai in dubai yeah let me also mention it, it, i think i don't see or, uh, where, where i don't it see it uh, happening in everywhere else in dubai in my opinion because of the covid and the situation i feel like the only they're gonna want it in dubai because of the fans it, that, that's the only place they can have fans at the moment so it's gonna the rematch will be in dubai in my opinion they'll make it of a fight island towards maybe yeah. the middle of the year or the end of the year yeah let, let's not forget to mention that uh Habib is there to uh, corner Umar. He, he will not be sitting there. Uh, imagine how cool it would be if Habib was sitting with Dana and Connor was fighting. Gets on top of the fence oh. with the Irish flag around his around him and calls out Habib, you little rat. You're, <laughs> you're gonna get knocked out in the first round. Imagine how cool that would be. It would be like a like a wrestling promo, but unfortunately that that won't be the case. Habib's not much of a showman, but uh, Connor will will have an iconic promo. After he knocks out Dustin, and we're going to see something really big happen. I do believe that that will be the first fight with a sold-out arena. That's what I'm predicting. It'll have a sold-out arena. It'll be a, a massive card, possibly uh, international fight week in July. Could you imagine a, a sold-out arena and just a massive fight card? Dana says he wants to stack that card. There's 
no bigger fight in the sport right now. Yep, one hundred percent. I agree. Uh, there is no, oh, sorry, there is no bigger fight in the sport other than maybe John Jones versus Adesanya. Uh, there's no other fight in, in in sport of MMA at the moment that I would rather want. Yeah, I do. I do believe that uh, that fight would break the pay per view record and everything. Also, also, I just disrespected Dustin a lot. I really like the guy. I believe he's an awesome human he's being. He's boxing as well. He's, he's going to be building a gym. Mm -hmm. He's going to be building a gym with the money that Connor donates to the Good Fight Foundation. And, you know, I really uh, commend that man for doing the great things that he's doing in his community and across the world. And I wish him a happy birthday. It is his birthday today. Uh, sorry for picking against you, but I just got to go with my gut here and go with Connor. Connor's the man. Connor could be champion this year. Assuming he doesn't fight Habib, you know, because Habib just, he's unstoppable. Oh, and guys, next week, there's no fights. January 30th, there's no fights for some odd reason. You know, we got to suffer once again through a week without any fights. But after that, we'll come back with Overeem and Volkov. But hey, that one week where there's no fights, we're going to be doing MMA trivia. We're going to assemble 10 questions each, and we're going to tell the other the question and we're gonna have to guess i think we'll we'll have it formatted uh in an a b c d style where we'll pick a letter that way it's not it's not just a complete guessing game so i i believe that'll be entertaining it'll be uh strange for the normal format of the show i hope you guys enjoy it and uh let's send it off lenny yeah exactly i agree so uh, main event of the evening max holloway uh, not max holloway i was looking at max holloway on my screen uh, dustin Poirier versus conor mcgregor at usc 257 back at uh fight island in dubai and uh we both agree that uh conor mcgregor will take the win but dustin Poirier, you know he's that's a long six years before the first fight is uh he's he's he, he regroups with a uh, brox he well not regrouped he got a new boxing coach who uh, told him that he should step up to 155 pounds. Same as Jorge Masvidal. If you have watched a countdown, Jorge Masvidal, you know, and, t and told him to step up to 155 pounds. He said he's more suited, and that's what he done. And his boxing coach, I forgot his name. He's he's a he's a he's a tall. I forgot his name. Uh, anyway, it starts with a D. I can't remember. But you know, he's told him to. He's really sorted out his Dustin's boxing. He looks incredible. Uh, so for, if you look at Dustin's boxing six years ago, and then now. Is vastly improved, but you know I think he's too hittable in his last few fights. Last lot of fights we've seen him very hit hittable, and against Connor, if you get hit, if you're very hittable, you're gonna get put to sleep, and that's what's gonna happen. I think Conor McGregor puts him to sleep, and then he, he you know, he calls out uh, Habib, and then that's the this is the end of the video, Oscar. You got anything else left to say? Yeah, you know, happy birthday, Dustin. Sorry for picking against you, and I hope you guys have the greatest time possible watching the fights this weekend. I know I will. It's going to be at a friend's house. Uh, shout out Nassim at Nassim double zero on Instagram. He's uh, he invited me over. You know, we're going to try to keep it to a minimum amount of people because of COVID. But hey, it's going to be great. Hey, it's going to be great. Send me a location. I'll be over. <laughs> Habib, send me a location. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, uh, for me and Oscar, a very good bye, and I hope you enjoy the fights. A huge pay-per-view that we had ahead of us this weekend, uh, UFC 257. We won't, we won't know the winner of Magni Chiesa yet, but we'll, we'll, we'll probably talk about that in Sunday or Monday's episode, maybe. And we're, we're, we might be have a new format as well. I'm gonna, we're going to invest into a, a, a software called uh, StreamYard, and uh, we're going to do it live. So people can watch us and we can react to comments. So that will be in the next episode. We will do it via StreamYard. I'll even probably check out after this. And maybe we'll have a, li a little play around. But you know. A very good bye from me and Oscar. We wish you the best of it. Ha have a very good day. And I hope you enjoyed the fights on the weekend. And Magni vs Kiesa. Hopefully they delivered. And we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you very much for joining me. From me and Oscar. A very good bye. Thank you very much.